Now wrapping up our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1243 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Representative Bill Johnson of Ohio has introduced a bill to eliminate private land use restrictions on amateur radio. Congresswoman Debbie Lesko of Arizona introduced a bill in Congress to replace the amateur radio symbol rate limit with a new bandwidth limit. Amateur radio operators are invited to participate in a new HARP experiment that will bounce signals off an asteroid. AWRL Straight Key Night is coming up and we will have all the details. Schoharie County in New York State has received funding for emergency communications improvements. A direct-to-full license exam opens in the United Kingdom as well as exam fee changes. We will tell you about them. A group of Marines got their amateur radio licenses recently. Santa is on the handbands through the end of the year. We will tell you how you can reach him. The Intrepid DX Group has announced the winners of its annual essay contest. We will introduce you to them. The Alexanderson alternator broadcast from Grimton, Sweden has been canceled due to COVID. A spacewalk outside the ISS was canceled due to the ship experiencing a micrometeoroid hit and venting coolant into space. And NASA has made public a decoded secret message that was on board the Orion spacecraft. We will tell you what it said and a lot more. That's all straight ahead on the Christmas Eve special edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about different ways you can improve your Wi-Fi signal for better coverage. Australia's own Anil Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, which way did my signal go? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to November 1963, the year that pitted hams against hams and hams against the AWRL. Bill will be talking about the introduction of incentive licensing. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, wraps up his latest four-part special about how to utilize amateur radio when you are taking a long trip aboard a train. And we will have our annual holiday special, an entertaining monologue about growing up with amateur radio from the late Gene Shepherd K2ORS. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service. This Week in Amateur Radio takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in chilly, cold, sub-zero, snowy, wet, Albany, New York, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting this week from the frigid tundra of central New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our frigid news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOI, wishing everybody around the world a happy holiday season. Coming to you live from just outside the capital of New York State, Albany, New York, and Glenmont, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio, where earlier today it was 55 degrees with a heavy downpour of rain, and within an hour it was 25 degrees and snowing in whiteout conditions. Welcome to Upstate New York. And reporting from a rainy, sleety, snowy Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I look out the front window and I see a white-covered lawn, and the weatherman says it's going to stay till Christmas, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, dreaming of a white Christmas coming true and wishing one and all Merry Christmas. We have a late-breaking news story as we come to air this week. Congressman Bill Johnson of Ohio introduced a bill in the U.S. House of Representatives on Thursday, December 22, 2022, H.R. 9670, 
to eliminate private land use restrictions that prohibit, restrict, or impair the ability of an amateur radio operator from operating and installing amateur station antennas on property subject to the control of the amateur radio operator. The exponential growth of communities subject to private land use restrictions that prohibit both the operation of amateur radio and the installation of amateur station antennas has significantly restricted the growth of the amateur radio service. These restrictions are pervasive in private common interest residential communities, such as single family subdivisions, condominiums, cooperatives, gated communities, master planned communities, planned unit developments, and communities governed by community associations. These restrictions have particularly impacted the ability of the amateur radio service to fulfill its statutory mandated duty of serving as a voluntary non-commercial emergency communication service. Congress in 1996 directed the Federal Communications Commission to promulgate regulations that have preempted all private land use restrictions applicable to exterior communications facilities that impair the ability of citizens to receive television broadcast signals, direct broadcast satellite services, or multi-channel multi-point distribution services, or to transmit and receive wireless internet services. The ARRL attempts to obtain similar relief for amateur radio were rejected by the FCC with a statement that such relief would have to come from Congress. ARRL Legislative Advocacy Committee Chairman John Robert Stratton, N5AUS, noted that Congress, in 1994 by joint resolution, declared that regulations at all levels of government should facilitate and encourage the effective operation of amateur radio from residences as a public benefit. He continued by stating that H.R. 9670, the Amateur Radio Emergency Preparedness Act, is intended to fulfill that mandate and preserve the ability of amateur radio operators to continue to serve as a key component of America's critical communications infrastructure. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, and Mr. Stratton both extended on behalf of the ARRL, its members, and the amateur radio community their thanks and appreciation for the leadership, Representative Johnson, and his tireless efforts to support and protect the rights of all amateur radio operators. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off our newscast this week, Congresswoman Debbie Lesko of Arizona introduced a bill in the U.S. House of Representatives labeled H.R. 9664 on December 21st, 2022, to require the Federal Communications Commission replace the current HF digital symbol rate limit with a 2.8 kilohertz bandwidth limit. John Ross, KD8 IDJ, is at League Headquarters and files this report. After being petitioned by ARRL in 2013 for the same relief, in 2016, the FCC issued a notice of proposed rulemaking in which it agreed that the HF symbol rate limit was outmoded, served no purpose, and hampered experimentation. But the FCC questioned whether any bandwidth limit was needed in its place. Most amateurs, including the ARRL, objected to there being no signal bandwidth limit in the crowded HF bands, and given the possibility that unnecessary wide bandwidth digital protocols could be developed, since 2016 there has been no further FCC action. In conjunction with introducing the legislation, Congresswoman Lesko stated that with advances in our modern technology, increased amounts of data can be put on the spectrum, so there is less of a need for a regulatory limit on symbol rates. I am pleased to introduce this important piece of legislation to update the FCC rules and to support the critical role amateur radio operators play and better reflect the capabilities of our modern radio technology. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, hailed the introduction of the bill. Roderick stated that the FCC's delay in removing this outdated restriction has been incomprehensible, given that the biggest effect of the delay is to require totally inefficient spectrum use on the already crowded amateur HF bands. I hope the Commission will act to remove this harmful limitation without waiting for the bill to be passed. You can read more about this legislation and see a copy of the bill at ARRL.org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. ARRL Legislative Committee Chairman John Robert Stratton, N5AUS, 
added that the symbol rate limit hampers experimentation and development of more efficient HF data protocols by U.S. amateurs. For all practical purposes, the field has been ceded to amateurs outside the U.S., where there is no comparable limit. Removing the restriction not only will allow U.S. amateurs to use the most efficient data protocol suitable for their purpose, but it will also promote and incentivize U.S. amateurs to experiment with and develop even more efficient protocols. The High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, or HARP, will be conducting a research campaign and experiment on December 27, 2022, with transmissions between 1100 to 2300 UTC, that's 0200 to 1400 Alaska Standard Time. This experiment will reflect HARP transmissions off of near-Earth asteroid 2010 XC15, and the echo will be received by the Owens Valley Radio Observatory Long Wavelength Array at the California Institute of Technology and by the University of New Mexico's Long Wavelength Array. The target asteroid will be roughly two lunar distances away from Earth at the time of transmission, characterizing the interior structure and composition of near-Earth asteroids is critical for advancing the understanding of solar system evolution and aiding in planetary defense. Actual transmit times are highly variable based on real-time ionosphere conditions and all information is subject to change. Currently, the Asteroid Bounce Experiment will take place December 27, 2022 from 1100 UTC to 2300 UTC, 9.6 MHz, linear FM, 0.5 Hz waveform repetition frequency, 30 kHz bandwidth. Reports recording echo are encouraged. Demodulated recordings in WAVE or MP3 are recommended. For real-time ionosphere conditions in Gakona, please consult ionograms from the HARP Diagnostic Suite at the HARP website. Amateur radio and astronomy enthusiasts are invited to listen to the transmissions and echoes and submit reception reports to the HARP facility at UAF hyphen gi hyphen haarp at alaska dot edu and request a qsl card by mailing a report to harp po box 271 gakona alaska 99586 usa in the united states the annual straight key night begins on new year's eve Many hams look forward to SKN as one of the highlights of their operating year. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with the details of this year's SKN. ARRL Straight Key Night, known as SKN, is January 1st, 2023 from 0000 UTC through 2359 UTC. Operators participate using Morse code, and all you need is your favorite straight key or bug. Many participants dust off vintage radios and keys and put them back into service each year just for SKN. And SKN is not a contest, so there's no need for quick exchanges. However, all hand keys, regardless of age, are welcome. The number of contacts you make is not important. The reward is meeting many new friends as you get together on the air. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. For straight key night, you can send a list of stations contacted, SKN stories and photos, and your votes for best fist and most interesting QSO to straightkey at ARRL.org by January 31st, 2023. For more information, see www.ARRL.org forward slash straight hyphen key hyphen night. The Schoharie County Amateur Radio Association was one of 27 agencies awarded funding from the Schoharie County Board of Supervisors Flood Committee at the end of November as part of money received from the New York Power Authority. The $15,000 received by the club will begin the process of linking each of the 16 municipalities with the County Emergency Operations Center using a standard kit of radio equipment for use by Amateur Radio Emergency Service and Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service operators. Equipment will include an HF 
VHF and UHF base station, antennas, and a computer dedicated to radio communications. A club priority for a number of years, this project helps to standardize the equipment used in an emergency and present a professional image to served agencies. Numerous floods in the Skohari Valley due to excessive snow melt and, more recently, post-tropical cyclones have demonstrated the need and value of a backup communication strategy. There have been documented instances of radio operators passing official messages between affected municipalities and the county EOC when all other means of communications had failed. The New York Power Authority, as part of its relicensing agreement for the Blenheim-Gilboa Pumped Storage Power Project, provides annual payments to the county, which are then distributed by the Flood Committee. This is one of the first years that these grants have gone to individual agencies. Past distributions were used to help establish a county ambulance service and provide infrastructure improvements for the county sheriff's office. Six months after publishing the new direct-to-full examination syllabus for UK license holders, the Radio Society of Great Britain is preparing to accept enrollments for the exam starting in January 2023. This exam is open to everyone, from foundation to intermediate candidates, but it was developed especially to accommodate those aspiring hams who already possess technical competence and would rather bypass the three-tier license path. Although the direct-to-full syllabus varies only slightly from the existing syllabus, a new item has been introduced regarding aperture antennas. If you wish more details on how to book for this exam, visit the RSGB website at rsgb org and select the option for exam announcements visible in the menu on the right-hand side of the screen. On Wednesday, December 7th, 2022, 22 communication officers at the Marine Corps Communication Electronics School in 29 Palms, California, became amateur radio operators. We go to John Ross, KD8 IDJ, who has more. W6BA, the Morongo Basin Amateur Radio Club, known as MARC, administered the exams, and 21 candidates passed their technician exam, and one passed their general exam. 14-year-old Kaylin Cossette, KN6WVD, was the youngest candidate who passed her technician exam. Retired Marine Corps Warrant Officer Robert Cortier, WO4ROB, says it was a great event, and he is excited to see so many new amateur radio operators. So what drove the officers to want amateur radio license? Well, Cortier pointed out that all of the candidates already have a background in radio administration, but not operating experience. Chief Warrant Officer Calum Cosset, KK4KC, one of the training officers, introduced the amateur radio uh, concept to the communication officers, said Cortier. Most of the students were curious on how to get their license, so CWO3 Corset contacted Mark to schedule an exam session. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Cloudier went on to say that all new license holders were offered a free club membership, but many of them will be deployed to other locations around the world and will be able to join other amateur radio clubs. He said they hope to conduct exams every three months. The Roscosmos Mission Control Team in Moscow postponed Wednesday evening's planned spacewalk with two cosmonauts to evaluate the situation and data from the Soyuz spacecraft. None of the crew members aboard the International Space Station were in danger and all conducted normal operations throughout the day. Roscosmos is closely monitoring Soyuz spacecraft temperatures, which remain within acceptable limits. NASA and Roscosmos continued to coordinate external imagery and inspection plans to aid in evaluating the external leak location. Plans for an additional inspection of the Soyuz exterior using the station's Canadarm2 robotic arm are underway. The leak was first detected around 7.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, December 14th, when data from multiple pressure sensors in the cooling loop showed low readings. At that time, cosmonauts Sergei Prokopyev and Dmitry Petalin were preparing to conduct a spacewalk. The cosmonauts did not exit the space station and no crew members were exposed to the leaking coolant. The Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft carried NASA astronaut Frank Rubio and Roscosmos cosmonauts Sergei Popkabiev and Dmitry Petalin into space after launching 
from the Bakanur Cosmodrome in Kakistan on September 21st. All amateur radio equipment aboard the space station is switched off during docking maneuvers and spacewalks. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station has announced a list of seven schools and host organizations selected to host scheduled amateur radio contacts with the astronaut crew on the International Space Station from July to December 2023. For more details, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. Earlier this year, nine schools and organizations were selected for contacts that will take place from January to June 2023 with the ISS. ARIS anticipates that NASA will be able to provide scheduling opportunities for these host organizations in the U.S. between July and December of 2023 in Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, Massachusetts, and South Carolina. The 16 schools and organizations selected for 2023 are now working to complete an acceptable plan that demonstrates their ability to execute a ham radio contact with ISS. Once their equipment plan is approved by the ARIS technician mentors, the final selected schools and organizations will be scheduled as their availability and flexibility match up with the scheduling opportunities offered by NASA. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Earlier this year, nine schools and organizations were selected for contacts that will take place from January to June 2023 with the ISS. The primary goal of the ARIS program is to engage young people in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math activities that raise their awareness of space communications, radio communications, space exploration, and related areas of study and career possibilities. ARIS does this by organizing scheduled contacts via amateur radio between crew members aboard the ISS and students. Before and during these radio contacts, students, educators, parents, and communities take part in hands-on learning activities tied to space, space technologies, and amateur radio. ARIS is a cooperative venture of international amateur radio societies and the space agencies that support the ISS. In the U.S., participating organizations include ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation. Sponsors are NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program and the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. The Western Massachusetts Chapter for Portable on the Air 413 recently conducted their ninth annual Ugly Sweater Activation. The event is held every year and known to the club members as USPOTA 413. The club welcomes this holiday public driven event that has the group activate a local, state, or national park or SOTA summit when possible with several operators organized from several station setups. Hosting member Diane Vierno, K1VWQ, noted, We normally like to have at least two stations running multi-operations, like 20 and 40 meters simultaneously. However, we have also been known to operate the event on 17, 10, 6, and 2 meters, Vierno added. Being portable on the air means welcoming all avenues of operations that are conducted outside. Even though this year was along the beach of Hampton Pond State Park, we have been known in the past to hold an ugly sweater activation from a soda summit such as Quabbin Hill. The POTA 413 Club was established and began operating in 2012, while the annual Ugly Sweater Activation event was first launched in 2014 at the Mount Tom State Reservation. The annual event has occurred outdoors every year, with the exception of 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, when participants of USPOTA 413 wore their ugly sweaters and chased parks and summits from home. Though it was not as much fun, they updated contacts and photos via social media. On January 1st, 2023, an international year-long amateur radio contest to honor Guglielmo Marconi will begin, and it is appropriately titled, Marconi Was Here. 
The main objective of the contest is to historically commemorate some of the most important and significant Italian cities where Marconi performed scientific experiments. Marconi conducted experiments in radio engineering, long-distance communications, radio direction finding, and many others. Overall, the experiments were crucial to the technical and scientific advancement and progress of wireless communications. Each month during 2023 is dedicated to a specific Italian city connected to the story of Marconi and is paired to a different special call sign. The Marconi Was Here Award is an international amateur radio award by ARI Fidenza Radio Club in collaboration with ARI, Associazona Amateur Radio Italiana and Marconi Museum. Further details about the special call signs, special certificates, and all of the rules are available on the official website, www.arifidenza.it. Once again, that's arifidenza.it. On Christmas Eve, 1906, Canadian inventor, experimenter, and entrepreneur Reginald Fessenden claimed to have made his first voice and music broadcast from Brant Rock, Massachusetts, although his account of the event over the years has been disputed. Nonetheless, Brian Justin, WA1ZMS of Forest, Virginia, will make his annual program Recreation on 486 kHz to commemorate Fessenden's accomplishments. Justin will broadcast for 24 hours beginning at 1800 UTC on December 24th, with a repeat transmission on New Year's Eve beginning at 1800 UTC, as Fessenden was reported to have done on both nights in 1906. Justin will transmit on 486 kHz under authority of his FCC Part 5 Experimental License WI2XLQ, using equipment substantially more modern than Fessenden's gear. Justin will use a homebrew setup to achieve Heising modulation, similar to what was used in amplitude modulation transmissions during World War I. Justin explained that Fessenden's transmitter was a high-speed alternator, a predecessor to the Alexanderson alternator still in use today at the historic Grimmerton radio station in Sweden. Modulation then was achieved using a carbon microphone, but Justin will use a laptop computer for his audio broadcast. Justin said there is a cult-like following of amateur radio and shortwave listeners who tune in for the annual broadcast. Justin has been licensed since 1976 and is an ARRL Life member. And, by the way, this note, the Grimmerton Christmas Eve message has been canceled. The Alexander Grimmerton Friendship Association in southern Sweden has announced the cancellation due to COVID-19. The radio station will be closed for visitors and SK6-SAQ will not be QRV or on the air. The United States government's Space Weather Prediction Center has proposed eliminating the recorded WWV geophysical alert message available from its local Colorado phone number at 303-497-3235. Callers to that number have been hearing the announcement about its discontinuation, which takes effect on January 15th, 2023. There are, however, numerous other ways to continue receiving this information. Robert Steenberg, AD0IU, acting lead of the Space Weather Forecast Office, said that the messages are available via subscription service on their website under the Forecast and Summaries category. He said subscribers can get these messages sent automatically every three hours when they are updated. Rob went on to say that the recording is a duplicate of the message already available from WWV via telephone at 303-499-7111 for WWV in Colorado and 808-335-4363 for WWVH in Hawaii at 18 minutes past every hour. He said the information is also available at the primary website of the center at PSS. Dot swpc.noaa.gov. Comments on this change can be submitted to the Space Weather Prediction Center at the website spaceweather.gov under the Feedback tab. And now, as a special Christmas present to all of you, 
This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to bring you this special presentation of a monologue given by Gene Shepard, the late K2ORS. Uh, I remember very cleanly and distinctly the, the excitement that Friday night meant. It's a fantastic, it, it always will. Uh, even to guys who are not in school, who are still not 15, uh, Friday night is a special, peculiar kind of a dangerous night. And what it meant to me, I have to, I have to admit one terrible thing uh, at, at one point in my life, what it really meant to me was Friday night was the one night that I could keep my ham station going until dawn. I did not have to get up early in the next morning. Even my paper route did not work uh, early morning Saturday. The paper was not delivered on Saturday morning. I made my collections Saturday afternoon, but I could stay up all night. And I would come, I'd come home from a date, you know, the whole scene. I'd have the, I'd have the whole bit going. And about, about 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, I'm with this girl. We're having a malt, you know. We're sitting in the drive-in watching Charlie Chan or some other big uh, opus of the period. I'm, I'm, uh, I can hardly wait. You know, I keep hearing it in my mind. I keep hearing the CQs on 40. I said, oh, boy, there must be. Gee, right now, about now, the West Coast must be coming in. Right about now, the, the W6s are starting to pound into the 9th District. And here I am sitting with uh, Esther Jane, you know. <laughs> I mean, Esther Jacobs saying, gee, what a, a penny for your thoughts. And I'd say, yeah, well... A penny for my thoughts. What was, what'd you say? What? What? She'd say, a penny for your thoughts. And I'd think for a minute, and I'd say, shall I tell her about that pie section network I was thinking of in my mind? This pie section network, I got a terrific idea to change the standing wave ratio on my 600-ohm feed, on my 40-meter my 40 zap. Shall I tell her about that? And then it would come out, you know, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, okay. And I'd say, you know, Esther, what I was thinking of, that, uh, that there is in the handbook, in the ARRL handbook, there's a terrific section on pie section networks. And I wonder if you'd like to go home with me and the two of us will build a pie section network that will reduce the standing wave ratio on the 600 ohm feeds to my 40 meter. And by that time, I'd see her drifting away. And she'd be looking out of the front window of the car now, and she's watching Charlie Chan again. I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? Just think of the fun we could have together. Y you could hold the solder, and I could take the soldering iron. And I'd say, give me the solder. Quick, 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 quick. Come on. Now put a plier down there. Hold it on that, on that terminal. Psh, oh, boy, would we have fun. And it'd be this long, pregnant silence. And I recognized that, once again, I had mighty Casey had struck out. And, and I could not, I, I knew then there were certain things that you just didn't talk to chicks about. Pie section networks, you do not discuss mercury switching systems with chicks. You do not discuss a Class C final with a chick. And <laughs> you, don't, you don't even discuss the, the ineffable mysteries of the universe of that kind with a girl. And I remember one period I was, I was plunged into a profound funk, a real funk, and oddly enough, just the other night, I'm looking in the newspaper, I'm sitting there, and I'm down at the Horn and Hard Arts, you know, and I got my egg cup in front of me and a big cup of Horn and Hard Arts coffee, and I'm just casually going through the paper. And it was a paper that I found there. It was, it was on, somebody's, on somebody's table. I'm just going through it. And suddenly, Skip, a name hit me. A name just stuck right out of the headlines there. Now, you, we're used to big, you know, regular names like President Johnson, Dean Rusk, and Charles de Gaulle, Mickey Mantle and stuff. It was a name? I says, no, it can't be. It can't be. And it was an obituary. And sure enough, there it was, the name of a man who probably nobody in the entire Horn and Hard Art, probably, I would say, anybody on 6th Avenue at that moment, sitting in coffee shops, sitting in H&H's, and sitting in Bickford's, wherever they might be, if I ran from one of those tables to the other and says, Look! Look! Look who died! Look at the name! Do you remember the name? The name would mean nothing to them. To how many of you does the name Heising mean anything? Did you ever hear of Heising modulation? Heising modulation. You know, there aren't many men in, in any field who give their name to an entire system or an entire uh, formula or a new discovery. You know, like the Salk vaccine. We all know the Salk vaccine. Uh, Dr. Salk's name will be familiar and will be famous for, for generations, the name Salk vaccine. 
We know about Freud, you know, the, the Freud dream analysis ideas and, and Dr. Freud's hypotheses and so on. We know about Einstein's theory of relativity. Well, Heising lived over here in Jersey. He died just a, just a couple of days ago. And I caught the name, and it was connected with one of the peculiar, long, blue funk moments I've ever had in my life. The Heising system of modulation is a system of AM amplitude modulation. Now, you're listening to me in most likelihood, if you're listening to 710 on your dial, I know you are, you're listening to amplitude modulation. That's AM radio. Uh, the other kind of radio is connected with another man. That's the FM radio. What's the name of the man, uh, really, who was generally credited as being, uh, being the genuine developer of FM radio? Come on, who is it? Uh, what kind of an engineer are you, for crying out? You know who it is. Why, he was, uh, there. isn't that sad? The great men of our time, hardly any, Major Armstrong. Oh, for heaven's sakes. He also was uh, involved in the, in the superheterodyne theories. That's another thing. There was a great man. But the name Heising, it, it became so mystical, so involved in my life, like a coal pits oscillator, for example. I wonder, I wonder if old man coal pits, who invented a certain type of oscillator, knew that for, for years and years and years there would be a little diagram in uh, question and answer manuals, in ARL handbooks that would say coal pits oscillator. Now, now, I, I'm not talking to you about radio here, so don't get bored here. I'm talking to you about something else. Can you imagine your name, let's say Witherspoon or uh, Aschenschlager? Let's say if, if, if there were textbooks to be printed for a hundred years from that, and it would say Aschenschlager's Law of Rottenness. And forever and ever, people would know the name Aschenschlager, and it's, it's not even a man anymore. It's, it's just a name. It's a name. Heising was not a man to me. I was astounded to find a Mr. Heising died. And I read the obit, and it was the one. It really was the Heising who had created this system of modulation. Well, let me tell you, uh, speaking, speaking of bad modulation, this is WOR AM and FM New York. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to go into a technical description of what the Heising system of modulation is. I could go into that. That's for next semester. Uh, we won't do that tonight, but I will, I will tell you this, that I am now on CW. See, I'm a kid. I'm about 14 years old. I'm a ham. And my whole life is, is connected with this stuff. And, and, of course, I was also involved in other things, like I'm playing football and I'm playing second base and, and I'm going out with Esther Jane Alberry and I'm going out with Don Strickland and I've got all the chicks going. You know, the whole scene is a gigantic fruitcake of existence. And connected with all of it, of course, and somehow weaving through it in, in this tapestry was this thing of back home in the front bedroom, my shack. And this was my special place, my shack. And you know, the day bed is over here, and the, the windows are over here. And the shack was a, was a bedroom we did not use. It was my shack. And I had this old table that I had bought from the Salvation Army for a dollar. And I'd cleaned it, and I'd put formica on the top of it and polished it. I had a little vice on the side of it, you know, and I had, I had the desk drawers all cleaned out, and I had compartments in there where I had resistors and condensers, and I had all the whole scene. I had a clipboard off to the left where I kept my log sheets and, and my plate readings and my grid drive readings and all that. And I had a rack. I had a four-and-a-half-foot rack that I bought. I bought it in an old used radio store, a place where you buy old radio junk, you know, and I bought this rack. It was a big four and a half foot rack, and it had big 19, 19 and a half inch panels across of it. And in it, this big four and a half foot rack, which was a great big piece of iron, I had a 10 watt transmitter. <laughs> that was the joy, the light of my life. It was CW, and every night uh, when all the other kids, you know, were sort of just hanging around the living room and walking around picking their teeth and crying and whining and looking out of the window and and the yelling down the hot air register, you know, the stuff that kids do, I would be in the front bedroom in my shack with my key. The time that Uncle Tom gave me that key, I will for forever remember. He gave me an old railroad, beautiful railroad key with a sidewinder, you know, a real key, see. And I would be down there at uh, maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and I'm on there with my cans, my Brandy's earphones hanging on my head, and I'm on 40 meters. My 6L6 is laying it down on 40, and I'm right there in the middle of the band. 7182 was my Bliley X-Cut crystal, and I am number one on 7182. 
And my, my rig had such poor voltage regulation, Skip, that the entire house, when I would press the key down, the lights would go, whoo, 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 whoo. And about every ten minutes, my old man was, would come bang. Well, you cut out that. I can't even read now already. I'd say, okay, Dad, all right. I'd sit there, and then I'd go, wait for a couple of minutes. I'd wait till, you know, you always wait till the ripples sort of die down. And the, the talk builds up again out there, and then I go, do, 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 do. A few little V's, you know. I am laying it out on 40. So this is my whole life. I walk around the streets with, with Esther Jane or with Helen Weathers or with uh, Dorothy or one of the chicks I was going with, and I would hear a horn. A car would go past, you see. And uh, I hear that old horn blow. You always hear this. If you're, if you're a real CW man, you hear it, and you can never get rid of it. You hear it all the time. I stand next to subway trains right now on 59th Street, and they come along, you know, and I hear the doors rattling and everything, and I hear them. They say things in coach. He goes past roaring out of CQ, you know. It's the double-A train. I can hear a CQ just as plain, just as plain and easy. You know? I'm walking down the street with Helen Weathers or with Dorothy Anderson, and I hear the horns. You know, the horn goes... Some guy sends a K. I turn around and go... And there's a dull silence there. And then I'd hear obscenities. I'd, I'd walk along and somebody'd send, send an obvious obscenity. He doesn't know he's doing it, you know. He'd just say, ba -da -ba -da -da -da. <laughs> I'd dig with Dorothy and I said, Did you hear what he said? She, she said, What? And of course, the word got out that I was kind of a nut. You know, kids who do things that all other kids don't do are always, always kind of looked upon as the nut, the crowd. Well, about that time, it was maybe about a year after I got on CW. And uh, I was going up for my Class A examination. Now, this is a special exam that you take that involves amplitude modulation. It's about telephone, radio telephone, this whole business that we're involved in right now. Right now you and I, you're, you're listening to me on a, on a radio set. I'm talking to you on an amplitude modulation transmitter and so forth. Well, that was that whole theory, diagrams and the whole business. And there was one special section called the theory, the adjustment and the maintenance of the Heising modulation system. And I got involved in that. Somehow I, I began to dig this system. I liked to, it had a nice had a nice symmetry about its diagrams. It was a nice somehow I dug the theory of the Heising system. <laughs> Don't ask me why, I can tell you now. One thing, it's cheaper than most other systems. And, and, and I began to dig this Heising modulation system. And then I began to go down to, uh, to the old surplus radio stores, and I began to look for chokes, filter chokes and stuff that I could build, I could use to make this Heising system. And it became almost the next big goal. You know, as we all live in our lives, uh, whatever little life we have, we have goals achieved and goals about to be achieved, and we have goals we're aiming at. All the time. So a guy may live uh, during a certain period in his life, and his, his idea is get a boat, get a boat. And he walks around the street, and he thinks about boat, 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 boat. Or, or he, he, he may have this thing, uh, uh, get a promotion, uh, get to be the uh, chief clerk, get, uh, get to be the chief clerk. And he thinks about this all the time, get to be the chief clerk. Other guys have the thing, yeah, I'm going to make money on the at and I'm gonna make I'm gonna make dough. You see, the the reason we we dig horse racing uh, and 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 the stock market and that kind of thing is because you can see goals achieved and also goals failed. That's part of it. And so our, each life, each day is a whole series of little goals. Uh, gee, if I can only get away to get a get a cup of coffee, holy smokes! If I can only get away to get a cup of coffee, oh wow, wow! And you go for about a half an hour, so you're working away there, and then all of a sudden you say, "I'm going to go." I'm going to go and get a cup of coffee. And boom, the next thing you know, you're sitting down there at that good old chock full of nuts, and a coffee's out there, and a goal has been achieved. A goal has been achieved. Bing, it's big, you know. It's there, you see. And there I was beginning to develop this thing, and heising modulation. Now, I know <laughs> this means nothing to you, but millions of hams are listening, and they're saying, yeah, man, yeah. Well, at that same time, there was a girl that I was really hung up on. I don't even remember this girl's name. It was one of those brief, momentary things, you know, where you get hung up on a chick. I remember she had dark hair, 
and she had sort of pink, light-type skin. And I remember she lived on the north side of town. And I remember I used to ride over there about every second day with my Elgin bicycle, like Mads with a gloam, just to look at her house, you know, that kind of thing. Just to ride past her house once in a while, like, hey, ah, look out! She'd never look out. But once in a great while, I'd see her at the tennis court, that kind of thing. And I had a big hang-up on this chick. And at the same time, I had a hang-up on Heising Modulation. Well, one day, I'm in this store, this old junky store that we used to go to. Uh, I'm, I'm down in the Ace Radio Shop. It's a crummy old, lousy radio shop. They have millions of piled-up turntables of old, uh, disreputable types, you know, wound for Bulgarian capitals, special types of winding that only work on six-and-a-half volts or some nutty thing like that, or 18-and-a-third volts, and all kinds of crazy equipment. And I came across the, the Transformer. It was perfect for my Heising modulation. Well, I had about a dollar. That was about as much as I could go. And old Sam, back at the counter there, at the, at the Ace Radio Shop, is looking me right in the eye, and he says, A buck, are you kidding? Do you realize it's a 300 mil transformer? What are you talking about, Mac? You don't find many of them anymore. That's a 300 mil Ford Darson transformer. And I... There I'm there, confronted with it. Well, that night, I had a date. I had one dollar. This son of a gun wanted two and a half for this transformer. Now, I had a total, probably a total stake at the time, of about three bucks, of which one dollar was to go for a transformer that day, or something else. Maybe I wanted to buy it. Whatever I was going to get was going to be a buck, see. I figured two bucks, well, we'll go down to the Orpheum, me and this chick, and it'll leave us uh, enough to get a hamburger over at Minor and Dunn's, and, uh, well, you know, it'll work out pretty good. I'll maybe squeak by with an extra quarter or two. I had it all figured out. Well, Sam looked me in the eye. I looked Sam in the eye. And right there on that counter in front of us, it was laying right there. Now, this is the curse that all men have had to face all their time. Uh, all men I know. Is it going to be a boat? Or... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. I don't think chicks have these kind of decisions to make quite as often as men. They may in the future. But men always have these little things, you know. They do. They have to decide whether or not to be a social animal or a rotten, crummy, selfish animal. Now, usually they, do, they devise it in such a way in their mind to be both. And so the guy will say, well, if I buy this transformer, I will be a happier person to be with. Not only that, I will, be, I will be more fulfilled. And then I could certainly be able to fulfill my role with Esmeralda much. But actually, I'm, I'm investing in her, if you look at it in a certain way. If you look at it a certain way, in a certain light, that the best thing I could do for her would be to buy this 300 mil Thor Darson transformer and build up my Heising modulation system, and from there on in it would be hotsy totsy. That's, well, that's the way my mind went. So, five minutes later, I am going home with this big transformer under my, oh, that excitement, you know, I had all the other stuff, you know, I was all ready to go. And that afternoon, I'm building and soldering, getting this thing going, you know, I got, a, I got the diagrams out, and I'm working down the circuit, the circuit values, and I've, I've, you know, I'm hinching a little bit, you know, I got a couple of things where it says point two micro micro farad condenser i got a point one you know little things like that all the way down yeah go for, i'll make it work you know the, the, the resistor that it should have been let's say 1500 ohms i had one that was 2700 ohms uh, you know what's that's close enough for jazz you know <laughs> so well anyway it's now about five o'clock or six o'clock there thereabouts and i have built my first modulator i don't know whether you know the excitement friends i i don't know how i can transmit this to you of going on the air for the first time on your transmitter. Now, I'm not talking about CB. This is nothing. This is kid stuff. Come on. None of that junk. And, and by the way, many people today confuse amateurs for CBers. They're totally different animals, completely. There is no parallel. But uh, a CBer bears about the same relationship to an amateur as a little grandmother riding along the West Side Highway in her 47 Plymouth bears to Sterling Moss. <laughs> it's about the same, isn't it? Roughly, yeah. They ain't at all the same thing. Don't confuse them at all. And so I, I, I'm, I've got this Heising modulation system all done. I've got a 6L6 tube in the final. i got a dummy load on it. 
and I'm all set to try it out, test the whole thing out. I got the microphone, I got a, a single button carbon mic, put the gain on, turn it all on, and then I, I stand back with the mic and I'm ready to go. And I've got my, I, I was using to test my modulation system, I have a 2 watt neon bulb which I could see <laughs> was about as close. And, of course, I had a milliammeter. I had an ammeter in the, in the plate and so on. And so she's heating up. Slowly, I apply the plate voltage. I had a variac, and I'm applying the plate voltage to my final. She's now up to 700 volts. That's a lot of voltage on that poor old 6L6. She's a bright, brisk, cherry red, you know. And I said, well, maybe I'll back it down a little bit. I go down a couple of notches, and I'm now I got about 500 volts on the plate, and then I switch in my Heising modulation. And there's one moment, just a moment of pause, when suddenly, without any warning, it goes. I get this fantastic chatter in my transformer. I back it down. I look at. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I turn off the switches. Get off the diagram. I'm checking it over here. Check, check, check. check. Everything checks out. <laughs> yes, indeed. Let's see here. Well, maybe I had just too much gain on the input there. Maybe she was overloading. Motorboating. That's it. She's probably motorboating. So I turn it on again. I stand back and wait. Everything in my, my 6L6s glow, this nice cherry glow. And I turn up the gain a little bit. Hello, hello. One, two, three, four. Hello, hello. Hello. Oh, hello. Ooh, for crying out loud, I back it down a little bit. Hello. Hello. By the way, Mr. Heising was doing this to me, in case you don't know it. The man who just passed into the great beyond over in Jersey. Hello. 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 And it was the first time that I'd ever encountered one of the major curses of mankind. Downward modulation. Now, that means nothing to your friends. <laughs> Except, suffice it to say, that when old Shep talks to you here, uh, the the uh, transmitted signal of WOR goes up. As my voice goes up, the transmitter, the signal goes up. Well, my transmitter was working the opposite. As I would talk into it, it would go down. <laughs> and I'm holding the thing up there. Hello, 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 hello. And now it's getting about 7 o'clock, see. Hello, hello, one, two, three, four. Oh, what a curse. And I could not get... And, and by that time, I decided, well, there must be something wrong. I'm not checking it right, so I'll call CQ. Hello, CQ, hello, CQ, hello, CQ, hello, CQ. And I'm tuning back. Across. Hello, I'm on 160, in case you're interested in the band. Hello, CQ, hello. And I stand by. And immediately, a guy comes back around on the frequency. Gong! W9QWN, W9QWN. Hello, no. Fantastic signal. W9QWN, W9QWN. This is W9XXX standing by. Do you hear me, old man? Oh, W9XXX. Yeah, this is W9QWN here. You're a Q5R9 plus here, old man. Handle here is Shep, S H E P. Shep. Handle here is Shep. We're running a single 6L6. About uh, 10 watts, uh, Heising modulation, uh, modulated by a single 10, uh, by a single 6L6 here, and a single button carbon mic. I'm using a 40 meter zip on the harbor tomorrow. Okay, W9XXX, uh, W9QWN uh, standing by. Kunk. Kunk. That signal comes back. W9QWN, this is W9XXX uh, here. I recognized him as one of the great famous hams of the area. You know, it's like talking. It's like if you're an aviation nut and all of a sudden you're hooked up with Lindbergh. You know, I mean, you're down at the flying club and you two are discussing flying together. You know. And he comes back to me and he says, mm, uh, What did you say the uh, handle was? I don't remember working you before. I just thought I'd call you. You're messing up the band. Uh, you're you're lousing up the frequency here. It sounds to me like you've got a little downward modulation, and I don't think you're final. It, it sounds a little bit like you're a lot of parasitics there. And uh, not only that, it sounds to me just a little bit like your neutralization is way off, man. I just thought I'd call you. I didn't want to get involved in any long rag chew. Uh, you better look into it, old man. And uh, I'm going to QR, QRT now. I think I'll pull a switch, and uh, don't bother to come back. You sound rotten. Uh, don't bother. Come back, old man. Uh, it's all right, fellow. Uh, your signal here is about, I'd say, around a Q3, Q2 to 3, about an R2. Well, that meant that he had to turn up everything he had just to hear me. And when he did turn it up to hear me, I was just rotten. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> he just, goom, he's gone. I'm sitting. 
Icing March Lation, eh? Yeah, I turn it on again. I take my neon bulb. This time I put the I put the, the dummy load in. See, I'm not going to radiate all over the band. And I get on there. Hello, hello. Keeps flickering downward. It's now 8:30, quarter to nine. My check has been waiting for me since seven. It's at seven o'clock. Well, I finally realize, you know, this is this is this is this is, this way lies madness. In this way lies the antisocial animal. And that uh, once you have committed yourself to the antisocial animal forever, you'll be down in some dank basement, surrounded by half-empty ball jars full of nails. The rest of your life will be given over to this insanity, whatever it is. I knew that even then, as an animal. I knew even then that hang-ups can devour you. And so, about quarter to nine, I looked at this thing, I says, oh. Okay. I turned it off. And 15 minutes later, I am picking up this chick. And ten minutes after that, we are on our way to the Aragon. We are on our way to <laughs> this place where they had these terrible bands and stuff, see? And all the way on up, all I could think of was downward modulation. All I could think of, it was like I had failed as a man. <laughs> I wonder, uh, it's too bad that Tennessee Williams doesn't write plays about the things that really get guys going, that really get guys hung up. I have known guys for two solid years Two solid years to be eaten up inside. I mean eaten up. Where they yell at their chicks. They threaten to kill their daughters. They, they, they take a shot at their boss because of one thing. They get rotten gas mileage. They're getting eight miles to the gallon. And it burns them up every time they go into that gas station. You know, they bought this monster and it takes 14 gallons of gas just to get the town and back. Ooh. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, Ahab and that, and that whale, you know. And so we are on our way to the Aragon Ballroom. Well, have you ever danced with a chick when you've got a heising system of modulation on your mind with downward modulation and also a bad problem with the par parasitics? All the time I'm hearing parasitics in my mind. And parasitics are awful things. They're like little... Uh, well, when you hear parasitics on the air, you know it. It's like a swarm of awful, angry, sort of somehow debauched, erotic locusts. They surround your signal. It's a fuzzy signal. If you could tune past WOR and it sounds like a, like a shaving brush that's been drinking, uh, that would be like my signal was on 160, and I'm bugged. Well, on the way home, after about uh, says, at least uh, four hours of dancing, it seemed like four hours, went on endlessly, back and forth, we're going. We're on our way home, and she turned to me, and she says, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I said, what, 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 what? I, I, already, you see, I was back in, in, in my shack. You know, I was sitting next to this chick on the Western Avenue car, but I'm already back in the shack. You know, and I've, I've got an idea. I'll tell you what it is. It must be the cathode. It must be my cathode biases. That's it. That's it. I, I, you know, I'm thinking, oh, oh boy, I can hardly wait to get home. Hardly wait to get home. I'm going to change that resistor in there. I know what it is. It's, I know what it is. I know. Oh, what a fool. What a nut. And she says, uh, now, come on. She says, you, I, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're one of the... You're one of the worst people that I've ever dated. I said, what? <laughs> um, you know, I don't make passes or anything. I'm a nice guy, you know. I took her out there. She said, you're one of the worst people I've ever dated. And she says, not only that, she says, but I think, I think that your mother ought to take you to a doctor. I think you're unhealthy. Unhealthy? It never occurred to me to be having a hang-up on a cathode follower circuit or having a hang-up on Heising modulation was somehow a perversion. It was a sickness. I said, well, unhealthy. I don't mean I play football and all that stuff. What do you mean unhealthy? Now I'm getting a little bugged with it. What do you mean unhealthy? Anybody with the kind of skin you got should holler about unhealthy, for crying out loud. She says, well, I don't care. She's bugged. Oh, a woman scorned, even at the age of 14, is, is hell on wheels. That's all i got to say. So I'm saying, well, what do you mean unhealthy? She says, well, I don't think you even talked to me once tonight. What do you mean talk? You didn't I buy an orange drink? I bought you knee high. I talk. I said I asked you if you wanted another one. I remember that. I said it was fun. I remember telling you it was fun. She said you did not talk to me once. All the time we were at the Aragon. Long pregnant pause. I said what am I going to talk to you? What do you know anything about downward modulation? She says what? I said well I've got worries. I'm worried. Can't you tell I'm worried? <laughs> Nothing is worried, more worried than a guy who is building something and it hasn't worked. I can tell you this, it drives you out of your skull. I said, I'm worried. 
and we rode all the way home on the Western Avenue car in silence. Got to the end of the line, took her home, says goodbye. Just goodbye. That was the end of that. I took off like a big speckled bird. <laughs> I'll tell you, I didn't think of her. It's eight seconds off. I'm, ooh, over the privet hedges I'm going, you know. I'm flying all the way home with my wings going, you know. Wow. Woo, up the front porch. Boom, in. Pow, into the front bedroom. Goom, goom, goom. The switches are going on. The old man sitting out in the front room there listening to the A&P gypsies or something, you know. And I got, I got all the switches turned on, everything going, waiting for it to heat up. I got the soldering iron heating up, and I've got the solder out there, and I have got that two micro micro farad condenser which i should have put in in the very beginning in the cathode it hit me halfway through red sails in the sunset what the problem was halfway through i just i what what's the matter with me i got a i got a one-tenth condenser in there it should have been a two at least a two micro micro farad i'm soldering this thing up you know boy i heat this baby out there i got the microphone going dummy load all right let's see putting in a little grid drive there. Now she's, oh boy, she's doing real good. You know, ooh, boop, ah. I tune the final plate. Ooh, what a dip. I'm tuning that final tank. Now, ooh. ooh. Advance the gain a little bit. Hello, one, two, three. Oh, what a beautiful sight. What a beautiful sight. My milliameter in the final plate is ticking up. Ever so slightly. Ding, 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 ding. Up, she's, she's working perfectly. I take my neon bulb. Hello, one, two, three, four. Hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. hello, hello. One, two, three, four. Hello. Beautiful envelope. Magnificent signal. Pow. Out comes the dummy load. In goes my 600 ohm Zep V. Boom, boom. I'm tuning her up. Oh, man. Up to the full 10 watts. Hello, 160. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Look at that meter flicking up in there now. Look at it right behind your head, Skip. Look at that beautiful sight. Hello, hello. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Hello, CQ. Calling CQ. I sat there until I was red in the face calling CQ. This is W9QWN calling CQ and listening. I developed that real snotty way, you know. So saying, and listening, come in there, boom. I'd wait. And of course, the band was one solid mass of heterodynes. I could hear nothing. Just woo, all the big timers are coming in. It's late at night, and then finally, about one o'clock in the morning, I hear this guy calling. Hello, W9QWN, W9QWN. This is W8LFD in Cleveland, Ohio, calling. Hello, 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 W9. Oh, fantastic moment of total joy. You know how the guys who have reached the top of Mount Everest feel? I know that feeling. I know that feeling of standing on the top of a glacier, looking out over the Himalayas. Nothing but achievement. You can't go anywhere after this. There I sat that night, working guys all over the Midwest with my 10-watt Heising system of modulation. And it wasn't until there was a postscript to this. Years later, I am out of the Army. Years later, oh boy, long time afterwards, I am going through a department store. I am home about a week and a half, and I still got my uniform on. And I'm going through a department store in Chicago, and who do I meet but that girl? That same girl. And she's working in one of the big stores. In fact, she was working in Carson, in case you're interested. And there she is. And I couldn't remember the chick's name. And she couldn't remember my name. And she was behind a counter. And we both stood there and I said, say, Ham and High, didn't you go to Ham and High? She says, yes, of course, you, uh, I remember you. I said, I remember you, do you remember the, she says, yes, the Aragon. We stood there for a second. And then she finally says, you know, you were kind of a nut. Did your mother ever take you to the doctor or something? See about that? I said, no, no, that, that problem's all cleared up now. It's all cleared up. Little did she know, little did she know that the problem was all cleared up. I was getting upward modulation. We hope you enjoyed our special Christmas presentation of Gene Shepard, K2ORS, telling us about ham radio when he was a boy. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. 
Let's talk tech, you and me. We're having a fun time. This is like a little user group here. We help each other. It hasn't changed much. Technology is still hard to use. Companies still don't really give you much help. And so that's what we're doing. We get together and we help our, help each other. Maybe you could cover the basics of Wi-Fi and what I can do to improve coverage. This is a universal question, uh, partly because, and you nailed it, we ask more of Wi-Fi now than we ever have before. The IoT devices, multiple phones, multiple computers, you might have a dozen or more devices sharing that Wi-Fi access. Uh, I checked myself on my home uh, Wi-Fi network, and I have two networks, one at Euro and one Orbi. I have more than 50 devices. Of course, I'm an outlier, but still, people have a lot of Wi-Fi devices now. Then, of course, your neighbor has lots of them too, right? In fact, if you you know, look at your Wi-Fi menu, you may be seeing a dozen different access points. Some neighbors are... Uh, are choosing Wi-Fi routers that say, we're super powerful, double, quadruple, MIMO, and they're interfering more with you than they used to. It all adds up to terrible Wi-Fi. Uh, and and it, it does underscore one particular problem that all Wi-Fi has. It's Wi-Fi is polite. If your access point, here's another access point, ha -ha, or another device ha -ha, on the network, it'll shut up, it'll clam up. It'll wait a random amount of time, then start again. And if it hears your neighbor's Wi-Fi ha -ha, on the same channel and the same frequency, it'll shut up again. That's why Wi-Fi is so inconsistent. You might even notice pausing. It's, it's terrible for uh, streaming video and, and voice calls. Most streaming video is buffering, so it's not as noticeable. But I have to say, when we do our shows with Skype, we tell all of our contributors and whatever you do, you can't be on Wi-Fi. You have to get a wired network, and that's it, that's for that reason. Uh, when it comes to improving your signal, I'm going to refer you a great article from Ars Technica. Jim Salter, who is really a guru of networking, wrote it. It's called The Ars Technica Semi-Scientific Guy Guide to Wi-Fi Access Points. And he recommends him a number of things. I'm not going to go through everything in the article. I would strongly recommend you read it because it's got some great tips for improving Wi-Fi. Tip number one, get a signal meter on your laptop or on your phone. If you have an iPhone, unfortunately, the way Apple works, they don't let third-party apps uh, access the signal strength coming in from the Wi-Fi radio. So iPhones are no good for this. But there are uh, soft, there's programs you could run like NetSpot on your Android device. If you have a laptop, Insider with two S's is really good from metageek.com. So once you get these on a portable device of some kind, laptop is fine, you're going to want to make a map of your Wi-Fi signals. Uh, in fact, there's a there's a Wi-Fi mapping app that I use on Android all the time. Let me let me just quickly check my Android phone because off the top of my head, I it's really handy for getting a sense, making an actual like colored map of all the all the Wi-Fi. It's called Wi-Fi Heat Map. And so if you have an Android phone, this is a great tool. You walk around your whole house, you'll then have a map with different colors of Wi-Fi. Signal strength, don't get obsessed about signal strength. Anything better than 67, minus 67 dB is, is, is fine. In fact, you can actually have a, if it's too strong, if that negative number is too low, like minus 10, it can actually overpower your system and make Wi-Fi worse. So minus 67 is normal. It, because that's a negative number, remember, anything lower, minus 66, 65, that's better. Anything higher, 68, 69 is worse. 67 is, Jim says, the cutoff point. You can also, in one of these Wi-Fi tools like Insider, see which bands are most congested. There are 11 bands in the U.S. on any given frequency. Really, there's only three because you have the middle band and the surrounding bands. Uh, that each channel uses up. And there's, of course, th three different frequencies. There's a 2.4 gigahertz frequency and there's two 5 gigahertz frequencies that Wi-Fi access points can use. It's great once you get a map of everything, you'll have a much better understanding of where the trouble spots are in your house, but also of which frequencies and channels your devices are using. Most of your devices can be allowed to pick the channel. It's It's really, I think, an exercise in a futility to try to assign channels. The devices will do, uh, I, and the router will do as, as good a job as you would, maybe better. And they may be moving those around from time to time. The thing to keep in mind is 
Wi-Fi, and this is a great analogy. I think Jim might have come up with this. Somebody did. Wi-Fi is like a lamp in a room. Uh, you, you get a pool of light from a lamp in a room, but as you go outside the room, that pool of light is weaker. Go through two doors, it's not going to make any difference at all. Wi-Fi is similar to that. A single wall will slow Wi-Fi down. By the time you've got two walls between you and the access point, you've got very little signal coming through. The farther away you get, the slower the service will be to the point where you just don't get any Wi-Fi at all. There's also other obstacles. And the worst obstacle in Wi-Fi is humans, those big bags of water that are walking around. If Wi-Fi has to go through a human, it's going to attenuate the signal something awful. And you can verify that with your signal meter standing in front of your Wi-Fi access point. Turn your back to it and move the signal meter back and forth. You'll see you really attenuate the signal. That's one reason you want to put your routers, your access points, and your extenders high up. Have them aiming down over the heads of humans, not firing through humans. That seems weird, but in fact, that does make a difference. Higher up is better for an access point. Signal extenders, those are the old school way of expanding Wi-Fi. You'd have an access point, and then you'd buy, you know, Linksys access point from Linksys, some signal extenders. The problem with them is they literally cut your Wi-Fi speed in half. And that's because... Half the time they're talking back to the main access point, half the time they're talking to your device. That means they can only transmit to your device about half the time, half the speed. That's why we've mostly gone to mesh systems. Mesh systems generally will have a separate back channel for communicating to the main access point. That doesn't impede the speed of the Wi-Fi access. So you get a very much better performance as you're getting farther and farther away from the main unit using those Wi-Fi satellites if you have a mesh system. At home, I have an Eero. I really like Eero. I have Orbi. Orbi's probably the fastest, but not as sophisticated as the Eero. I know mesh systems are more expensive, but using a mesh system will give you a much better result, in my opinion, uh, than using uh, signal extenders. There's the advantage also that you can add uh, satellites to almost all mesh systems at a lower cost. You buy an extra satellite so you can extend it as needed. And generally, uh, as long as you position the satellites within good range of the main unit, you're going to be able to boost your Wi-Fi uh, farther and farther out. So that works pretty well. There are a lot more tips that Jim has about Wi-Fi. I would recommend reading that article in Ars Technica for all of the ins and outs. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. I will give you one more um, a point that might help a lot. Sometimes Wi-Fi just isn't going to make it from this end of the house to that end of the house, uh, in which case you might use a wired solution to expand your Wi-Fi. What? Wired to expand my Wi-Fi? Well, you already have wires in the walls of your house. You have your electrical grid. You also have, probably from your cable television system, you have coaxial cable in the walls. Both of those can be used to extend Wi-Fi. I recommend and I've used the TP-Link uh, home line uh, networking or power line networking devices. They're fairly inexpensive. The way it works is you'll have your Wi-Fi access point, your main router here in, uh, let's say, the living room. By the way, that's one other point Jim mentions is Put that as central as possible, obviously, to shorten the distances uh, to the radius instead of the full length of the house. But you've got your centralized Wi-Fi access point. You get one of the little power line adapters, plug it in via Ethernet, then plug it into the wall. And as long as you don't have a junction box in between that plug in the wall and another point in the house, you can plug a receiver into the other end. Now these are connected via physical wires, your electrical wires, and it has either a Wi-Fi access point on it, TP-Link makes those, or another Ethernet jack that you could put into one of the satellites. That's one of the nice things about the old Eero system is you could actually put an Ethernet into the satellites to expand your Wi-Fi. still counts as one system, but uh, it's helped out by the wire in the wall. So that's, uh, that's uh, TP-Link. Others make these power line networking. Uh, they're fairly inexpensive, and that's a really good way to expand your network using wiring in the house. I mentioned cable. The coaxial cable can also be used with a system called MOCA. 
But uh, you'll need to have a little bit more expensive Mocha adapters. Same idea, though, one on each end that's connected via Ethernet to an access point. So before the, all of this is talks, I'm talking about spending money. Before you spend a lot of money on new gear, it's well worth doing an assay of the house and try moving things around a little bit. A couple of things to keep in mind. 2.4 gigahertz is a more crowded band. That's the original Wi-Fi band, but it's the one that goes the farthest. If you're trying to get something outdoors like a doorbell, 2.4 gigahertz is almost always the best choice. 5 gigahertz may work better. It doesn't go through walls as well, but for that reason, there's less interference from neighbors and other Wi-Fi going on in the house. So generally, if you're nearby 5 gigahertz, uh, an access point or a satellite, 5 gigahertz is preferable. It's when you're far away that you want to go to 2.4 gigahertz. New gear will always improve uh, your connectivity. There is now a new standard Wi-Fi uh, 6. That's 802.11ax. That has some other features to help solve this problem. Uh, eventually, you're going to get more and more Wi-Fi 6 devices that will be able to take advantage of a Wi-Fi 6 router. So maybe the next time you buy a router, you might want to look at Wi-Fi 6. There's a lot there. It's a difficult challenge. And as any radio engineer will tell you, RF is kind of voodoo science. It's very difficult to figure out where things should be placed. But it, you can off, often improve your signal just by a slight repositioning of the satellites, the access points, and, uh, and of course, your devices. But it is possible to improve your Wi-Fi. And it's well, well worth it. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. Mention November 22nd to many people in the U.S., and they will immediately associate it with the date that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. But for amateur radio operators, especially those licensed for more than 40 years, it means something totally different. Incentive licensing. In a three-stage process starting on November 22, 1967 and ending on November 22, 1969, the FCC instituted incentive licensing, ostensibly designed to encourage amateurs to upgrade, but in reality a process under which most amateurs lost up to 50% of the frequencies they usually operated. Incentive licensing, or incentive punishment as some have called it, has been blamed for the demise of many American amateur radio equipment manufacturers such as Hammerland and Halicrafters, a temporary decline in the number of licensed hams, and bitter feelings against the ARRL and the FCC that last to this day. As we approach the 40th anniversary of incentive licensing, let's take a look at the events that led up to this controversial decision. In order to do so, we must go back to 1951. Prior to 1951, a rather simple license structure existed in this country. Amateurs had a Class A, Class B, or Class C license. Class A conveyed all amateur privileges on all frequencies, including exclusive access to the 75 and 20 meter phone bands. Class A required passing a comprehensive theory exam and a 13 word per minute CW test, which included sending as well as receiving. Class B conveyed all CW privileges on all bands and allowed phone operation on 160, 11, and 10 meters in the HF spectrum and on all VHF and UHF frequencies. Note that 75 and 20 meter phone operation was limited to Class A hams. What about 40 and 15 meters? Well, 40 at that time was CW only. And as for 21 megacycles, it wasn't a ham band back then. 15 meters was given to us in 1947 in exchange for the 14.35 to 14.4 megacycle segment of 20 meters, but the 15 meter band actually wasn't available to hams until 1952. In addition, 160 meter access was severely restricted at that time because of the Loran radio navigation and 11 meters was a secondary U.S. only allocation with limited popularity. So. The Class B ham who wanted HF phone operation went to 10 meters by default. 
Class B hams pass the same 13 words per minute code test as Class A, but a less comprehensive written test. Class C gave the same exact privileges as Class B, but the exam was given by mail under the supervision of a Class B or higher license to those who couldn't walk the 175 miles uphill both ways through the snow to a quarterly FCC examination point. In 1951, the FCC reorganized the entire license structure. Class A was replaced by the advanced, Class B by the general, and Class C by the conditional. Three new licenses were created at that time, the Extra, Technician, and Novice. The Extra, actually Amateur Extra, had a 20 words per minute code requirement and a written exam more difficult than the old Class A. In order to qualify for the Extra, one needed to be licensed as a Class B or General for at least two years in addition to passing the test. However, if you held a Class B or General license or higher, and you were licensed prior to April 1917, you could get an extra with no additional test. Technicians had to pass the general theory and a five words per minute CW test. They had privileges above 220 megacycles only. Novices had a basic 20 question written exam, the five words per minute code test, and limited CW privileges on 80, 11, and two meters, as well as voice privileges on two meters. This was a one-year, non-renewable license. The advance was available until December 31st, 1952 for upgrades or new licenses, at which time it was withdrawn from availability. Those holding advanced class licenses could continue to renew, but no new licenses were issued. In 1952 and 1953, the FCC also dropped a couple of other surprises. Phone operation was allowed for the first time on 40 meters, 15 meters was finally opened, the 14.35 to 14.4 megacycle segment of the 20 meter band was removed from the amateur service, and in the biggest bombshell of them all, generals, former class B, and conditionals, former class C, were given access to all former exclusive class A phone frequencies. Now the conditional, general, advanced, and extra class operators had the exact on-the-air privileges. During the 1950s, novices were given 40 and 15 meter CW privileges in addition to their 80 meter segment and 11 meters was removed. Technicians got 6 meters in 1955 and the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of 2 meters in 1959. Technicians could also hold a novice class license simultaneously. Many amateurs were unhappy with this structure. Extras complained that they had to go through a two-year waiting period as a general or advanced, had to pass a difficult test, and yet received no exclusive frequencies for their efforts. Advanced class amateurs were upset with the limbo status of their licenses, the fact that they no longer held the highest class license, and the fact that they no longer had exclusive use of 75 and 20 meter phone. General advanced and extra class amateurs complained that novices should not have been given 15 meter CW. The general advanced and extra class hams were also opposed to increasing technician class privileges for reasons we will see in our next installment. In summary, although the vast number of hams were satisfied, a small minority had complaints, and the ARRL listened. In 1963, acting on complaints they claim they received from members and operators in other countries, the ARRL proposed incentive licensing. In an editorial, the ARRL implied that perhaps it was a mistake when the Class B and Generals were given the 75 and 20 meter phone segments. The ARRL stand was now clear. Exclusive frequencies must be restored to the advanced and extra class amateurs in order to give generals an incentive to upgrade. Of course, what was left unsaid was that in order to do so, frequencies would have to be taken away from the general class hams. What was the ARRL's original proposal? How did hams react to it? What was the controversy about the technician class license that was dragged to the forefront in this battle? Be on board next time for the answers. With continuing COVID-19 restrictions precluding an in-person gathering, the 24th Annual Ham Radio University, or HRU Educational Conference, will be held on Saturday, June 7, 2023, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or 1300 to 2000 UTC. As a go-to webinar, 
online video conference. Registration is now open for Ham Radio University's 17 informational presentations by experts in a broad range of amateur radio activities, including building an HF station, basic practical antennas, basics of HF operating, contesting and DXing, software defined radios, HF digital communications, satellite communications, using Raspberry Pi computers and amateur radio, parks on the air cables and connectors, and shack grounding. Presented in memory of Ham Radio University founder Phil Lewis, N2MUN, Ham Radio University 2023 also will be the online convention of the New York City Long Island section of the ARRL. As in years past, participation in Ham Radio University 2023 will be free of charge with an optional suggested donation of $5, but advanced registration is required for each presentation. Detailed information, including the schedule of forums and advanced registration for each one, is online at www.hamradiouniversity.org forward slash forums. Bruce Page, KK5DO, has filed his AMSAT report for this week. And as we have mentioned, CAS-5A recently as one of the newest amateur satellites. It has now been issued the official Oscar number. It is known as Fentai Oscar 118, or FO 118. Congratulations to the Chinese amateur radio group CAMSAT for their efforts in having this satellite designed, built, tested, and it is operational. They worked with local education authorities and students from 10 high schools. One of the more unique features of the satellite is that it has a VU linear transponder as well as a VU FM repeater. A lot of fun, whichever method you prefer, maybe both. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who says that about seven hours after the start of the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere on Wednesday, December 21st, at 2147 UTC, it is very cold in Seattle, about 17 degrees Fahrenheit on the longest night of the year. Solar activity during the week, however, was down a bit from the previous week, although it is one of those odd occasions when average daily sunspot numbers and solar flux changed in opposite directions. Average daily sunspot numbers declined from 136.9 to 124.1, while solar flux rose from 150 to 153.7. Geomagnetic indicators were a bit lower, with the average daily planetary A index changing from 7.7 .7 to 6.7, and the middle latitude numbers from 6 to 5.1. So here we go, taking a look at the predicted solar flux, which appears to be able to reach a short-term peak of 160 on January 4th through the 7th. Starting December 22nd, 2022, the forecast shows 140 and 135 through December 23rd, 130 on December 24th and 25th, 135 on December 26th through the 28th, 130, 135, and 138 on December 29th through the 31st, and then 140, 150, and 155 on January 1st through the 3rd, and 160 on January 4th through the 7th. A quick look at the planetary A index shows us that it will be 12, 8, 5, 14, and 10 on December 22nd through the 26th. It'll be 8, 5, 12, 10, and 12 again on December 27th through the 31st, and then 8, 5, and 18 on January 1st through the 3rd, 10 on January 4th and 5th, and 8, 10, and 6 on January 6th through the 8th. In radio sport contesting on December 26th, it's the DARC Christmas Contest, that's CW and phone. On December 28th, the SKCC Sprint, that's CW. On December 30th, the Yoda Contest, CW and phone. On December 31st, the Bogar Old and New Contest, that's phone only. Then on January 1st, the AGB New Year's Snowball Contest, CW phone and digital. Also on January 1st, the SARTG New Year Ready Contest, that's digital. And on January 30 for January 1st, rather, the AGCW Happy New Year contest. That is uh, CW as well. And you can find a complete list of context available at ARRL.org slash contest. And some upcoming section state and division conventions for January 2023. On January 7th, it's Ham Radio University hosting the ARRL New York City Long Island Section Convention. That is an online event. 
And January 20th through the 21st, the Southwest Florida Regional Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Southern Florida Section Convention. That is in Fort Myers, Florida. Foundations of Amateur Radio Propagation, the art of getting a radio signal from one side of the globe to the other, is a funny thing. As you might know, I've been experimenting with Whisper, or Weak Signal Propagation Reporter, and for about a year running a beacon on 10 metres. Out of the box, my beacon uses 200 milliwatts to make itself heard. I couldn't leave well enough alone, and I reduced the output power. Currently, a 10 dB attenuator is connected to the beacon, reducing output to a notional 20 milliwatts. I say notional, since I haven't actually measured it, yet. With so little power going out to my vertical antenna, a homebrew 40-metre helical whip built by Walter, Victor Kilo 6 Bravo Charlie Papa, now Silent Key, and tuned to 10 metres with an SG-237, it's interesting to discover what's possible. Last night, my signal was heard in Denmark, picked up by Jorgen, Oscar Zulu 7 India Tango, 13,612 kilometres away. That report broke another personal best for me, achieving 680,600 kilometres per watt. I was stoked. I shared a screenshot of my report with friends. One friend, Alan, Victor Kilo 6 X-Ray Lima, asked a very interesting question. What makes you think it was short path? Before I go into exploring that question, I need to explain. If I was to fly from Perth to Sydney, the popular way to travel is across the Australian Bight, over Truro, north of Adelaide, clip the northern tip of Victoria, over the Blue Mountains to Sydney. The distance is about 3,284 kilometres. This route is known as the Great Circle Route, more specifically the Short Great Circle Route. It's not the only way to travel. Instead of heading east out of Perth, if I head west, I'd fly out over the Indian Ocean, Africa, the Atlantic Ocean, the Americas, the Pacific Ocean, and finally arrive at Sydney. That journey would also follow a Great Circle route, the Long Great Circle route. It's about 37,000 kilometres long. You might notice that I wasn't very specific with either the path or distance. There's a reason for that. None of the tools I've found actually provide that information, other than to point out that the entire circumference of the planet is about 40,000 kilometres and that it's not uniform since Earth isn't a perfect sphere. You might be asking yourself at this point, why am I spending so much energy worrying about taking the long way around and how that relates to my 20 milliwatt whisper beacon? In amateur radio, we refer to these two travel directions as the short path and the long path. Radio signals travel along the curvature of Earth bouncing between the ionosphere and the surface. How that works exactly is a whole different topic, but for the moment it's fine to imagine a radio signal skipping like a stone on water. As a stone skips, a couple of things happen. If the angle at which it hits the water is just right, it will continue on its journey, get the angle wrong, and you hear plop. Every skip is slightly lower than the previous because the stone is losing a little bit of energy. Every time the stone touches the water, it creates a splash that ripples out in a circle from the place where the rock hit. These ripples also get weaker as they increase in diameter. Consider what happens if you skip a rock across concrete or sand instead of water. And if you really want to geek out, there's also wind resistance on the rock. A complex equivalent dance affects a radio signal when it propagates between two stations. For success, enough radio energy needs to reach the receiver for it to be decoded. For our signal to make it to the other side of the globe, it must bounce between the ionosphere and Earth's surface. Every bounce gets it closer to the destination. Each time it loses a little bit of energy. This loss happens at the ionosphere, at the surface, and in between through the atmosphere. To give you a sense of scale, my signal report from Jorgen in Denmark was minus 28 dB. It started here in Perth as 13 dB, so we lost 41 dB along the way. We're talking microwatts here. I'll note that I'm avoiding how this is exactly calculated, mainly because I'm still attempting to understand how a whisper signal report actually works, since it's based on a 2.5 kHz audio signal. As I said, enough energy needs to make it to the receiver for any of this to work. There's an assumption that less distance means less energy loss. It's logical. A shorter distance requires less hops, and as each hop represents a specific loss, less hops means less loss. 
but is that really true? There's nothing stopping my beacon signal from taking a different route. Instead of travelling the short path, it can just as easily head out in the opposite direction. Theoretically at least, my vertical antenna radiates equally in all directions. The long path is mostly across water between Perth and Denmark. What if hops across the ocean were different than hops across a landmass? Turns out that they are in several ways. For example, there's less energy loss in a refraction across the ocean. How much less exactly is still being hotly debated. Much of the data is empirical at the moment. It gets better. What if I told you that the report was near to sunset? At that time, there's a so-called grey line phenomenon related to how the sun stops exciting the ionosphere and how different layers of the ionosphere start merging. As a result, the angles of refraction across the ionosphere change and longer hops are possible. What if the long path took less energy to get to Denmark than the short path did? Would Jorgen's decoder care? If that's the case, my signal didn't travel 13,612 kilometres, it travelled twice that, and I'd have well and truly cracked a million kilometres per watt. So, is there a way we could know for sure? Well, yes and no. For starters, we'd need beacons that transmit at a very precise time. Then we'd need synchronised receivers to decode the signal. A signal travels 3,000 kilometres in a millisecond, so we're going to need something more precise than the timing set by NTP or the network time protocol used by your home computer. If we use GPS lock transmitters and receivers, we'd be working in the order of 50 nanoseconds and be in the range of 15 metres accuracy. That would allow us to calculate the physical distance a signal travelled, but that's not the whole story. What happens if your signal travels all the way around the globe? Or if some of it reflects back, so-called backscatter, like the ripples from a stone coming back towards you, and that signal travelling back past you to the receiver? There's endless variation since the planet isn't round with a flat surface, nor is the ionosphere. So, do we know if my report was a long path or a short path? Not really. Based on the time of day, there's a good chance that it was a long path report. But only if we actually measure the delay between send and receive will we have data to make a better assurance than possibly or probably. As I started, propagation is an art. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The first of the year is just around the corner, and many ham clubs across the country are electing new officers and making changes. For ARRL affiliated clubs, this is a good time to check your listing on www.arrl.org and make any updates. There are a few parameters that you need to be aware of in order to make these edits. You must be logged into the ARRL website as a member. To make changes to the club listing, you must be listed as a club officer or the club contact. Only these folks can make changes. If you meet the two requirements already mentioned, you should see the Edit button on the upper right corner of the club listing webpage. All affiliated clubs and special service clubs need to do annual updates to maintain their status. If no updates are made for two years, you run the risk of being listed as an inactive club and not being shown in the club listings. And finally, if you are not listed as a club officer or the club contact, you can contact your section manager, your affiliated club coordinator, or send an email to clubs at arrl.org and ask for help. Some clubs make no changes, while others change everything. No matter what the situation with your club, checking your listing and making sure that contact information is up to date is never a bad idea. Further, if your amateur radio club is planning to host a convention, ham fest, tailgate, or swap fest, please consider applying for it to be an ARRL sanctioned event. To learn what it means to be an ARRL sanctioned event, and get some ideas on how to prepare for and conduct a ham fest or convention, visit www.arrl.org forward slash ARRL hyphen sanctioned hyphen events. To have your event sanctioned, complete the online application at www.arrl.org forward slash ham fest hyphen convention 
hyphen application. The ARRL Hamfest and Conventions calendar can be found online. In addition, the Convention and Hamfest calendar that runs in QST each month also presents information about upcoming events. U.S. President Joe Biden's administration is drafting an executive order intended to streamline approval for private rocket launches amid a broader effort to bring legal and regulatory clarity for American companies on everything from space travel to private space stations, according to two United States officials familiar with the effort. The order would be part of a push by the White House National Space Council to modernize United States space regulation which has failed to keep up with the increasingly ambitious pace of private sector investments and development. The order, slated to be ready for Biden to sign by early 2023, is meant to simplify licensing procedures under existing laws for more routine space activities like launching rockets and deploying satellites. The Radio Society of Great Britain Board of Directors has reviewed the amateur radio license exam fees and has decided that there needs to be an increase beginning on April 1, 2023. This is the first time in over 10 years that the exam fees have risen and the new fees are still well below the cumulative rate of inflation since 2011. The cost of each license level exam will be Foundation, 32 pounds 50 pence, intermediate 36 pounds, full 42 pounds. Once again, the new fees will come into effect for exams taken beginning on April 1st, 2023. Up until about a decade ago, an average of 80 to 100 satellites per year were launched into varying orbits. Some re-entered Earth's atmosphere quickly, while others will remain in orbit for decades. This now seems quaint. In the last five years, driven largely by the rise of communications networks such as SpaceX, Starlink, and a proliferation of small satellites, the number of objects launched into space has increased dramatically. In 2017, according to the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, the annual number exceeded 300. By 2020, the annual number of objects launched exceeded 1,000 for the first time. This year, the total has already surpassed 2,000, with more broadband from space networks like Amazon Project's Cooper on the way, further growth can be expected. This radically increasing number of satellites, most of which are orbiting within 1,000 kilometers of the Earth's surface, comes as low Earth orbit is ever more cluttered with debris. For example, just last month, a Chinese Long March 6A rocket's upper stage unexpectedly broke apart after delivering its payload into orbit. There are now more than 300 pieces of trackable debris at an altitude from 500 to 1,000 kilometers, and in November 2021, Russia shot down its own Cosmos 1408 satellite, creating more than 1,000 fragments in orbit. NASA's International Space Station still has to dodge this debris to this day. At some point, the heavens above will reach a breaking point. Yes, space is big, but there is so much junk out there. Scientists and engineers estimate that there are hundreds of thousands of pieces of orbital debris about the size of a blueberry that cannot be tracked. Given their velocities of many times the speed of sound, these small objects have the kinetic energy of a falling anvil. Then there are tens of thousands of pieces of trackable debris the size of a softball or larger that have the kinetic energy of a large bomb. While some of this debris gets dragged down into Earth's atmosphere and burns up, every day, humans are rapidly creating more of it. From Bangalore, Delhi, Chennai, and Kolkata, Parks on the Air India and Oscar India are celebrating Christmas by putting Santa on the air through the 31st of December. The call sign AU2SOA, Santa on Air, can be heard using single sideband and CW on HF, operating a digital SSTV broadcast, and looking for QSOs on Echolink. To make contacts on FT8, be listening on 20, 15, and 10 meters. See QRZ.com for QSL details. QSOs will be confirmed via EQSL. On Christmas Day, December 25th, operators will be on various HF bands, activating a park and will be spotting AU2SOA operators at www.parksontheair.com. 
Finally, on the last two weekends of December, Parks on the Air India will activate AU2SOA on 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters, transmitting an SSTV broadcast. The photo you download will serve as your QSL card. The SSTV transmission can be decoded via the receiving programs RX SSTV and MMSSTV and on Android phones via Robot 36. Meanwhile, the Radio Club of Pasula, OH9W, and Northern Radio Arcala, OH8X, are activating the station they say belongs to the Genuine Santa from Northern Finland, next to the North Pole. Old Father 9 Christmas, OF9X, recently began activity on all amateur radio bands and all modes, CW, SSB, and digital. You can expect Santa's work to continue this year until December 31st at 2159 UTC. According to the QRZ.com page for OF9X, this year's special theme will focus on children in trouble areas of the world and will take the form of a puzzle to be solved by letters the operators will be handing out to their contacts. See the station's page on QRZ.com for details about how to submit the puzzle results for an award. You can also see a list of hams who have already contacted Santa and his elves. I'm Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Long before I took my rail trip with Amateur Radio, I researched it online and was surprised by the number of people, non-hams, who buy and program handheld scanners to listen to the train crews and dispatchers along the way. When our train was delayed due to a freight train on the same tracks with a busted airline, I was the only passenger that knew the actual reason for the delay, even more than many of the people working on board the train. Most hams love to talk with and meet people, which is one of the big attractions on Amtrak. Talking to people in the dining car, I was surprised by the number of people who are riding the train as the vacation, seeing the sights in a more relaxed atmosphere, and a very nice way to sleep at night. Some people purchased 30-day rail passes and were traveling what they called the Big Circle, which had them going from Chicago to Seattle to Los Angeles to New Orleans to Washington, D.C., and back to Chicago. They'd get off in the larger cities for a couple of days and do laundry and get readjusted to a bathroom that doesn't rock side to side, then repack and reboard another train and continue their round-the-nation rail adventure. Many of these big circle people brought a GPS along and used a windshield mount to hold it into the window in their sleepers. Using a GPS on the train to see exactly where you are and how fast you're moving, I learned a valuable lesson. Those GPS units designed for the car that give turn-by-turn -turn directions are not ideal for use on the train, but they do work. So many of these GPS devices also now give warnings when you drive more than 10 miles an hour over the posted speed limit. But on the train, you're never in control of how fast the train moves, and there are no school zones. But the GPS doesn't know that and beeps and flashes warnings regardless. And even though the train tracks show up on the GPS, the little car icon will always appear on the nearby road instead. For all my future rail trips, I'm going to use a handheld GPS instead, something that doesn't warn me when my train is going 60 miles an hour in a school zone. On my trip, I worked out a schedule to talk to a couple hams I know in Central Texas. For my train ticket I printed the day I purchased it, I knew what room I'd be in, and I also found a floor plan of the rail car I'd be in online so I knew who I could talk to based on what side of the train I'd be on. Since the stainless steel body tends to make your radio signal somewhat directional out the nearest window. But one thing I didn't account for is that all train cars except the engines can run in either direction. So until you get on board the train you'll never know for sure what side you'll be on. And at large stations where they add or remove cars, your car may be turned around so you'll have no promise of being on any particular side of the train for the entire trip. To sum up, some important things I learned about taking amateur radio on the rails are 1. Keep your radio concealed. There are usually things near the window you can use to wedge your HT right next to the glass. Always use an earphone or headset and program all the VHF rail channels before you travel. And be sure to download all the dispatch frequencies in cities your train stops so you can stay informed. That way you'll know more than most of the people on your train. 2. Handheld GPS like the Model 20X works better than turn-by-turn -turn GPS for the car. 3. The passenger cars have electrical outlets all over the place for charging your HT or computer, but I'd bring spare batteries anyway. 4. Some good reasons not to take the train would be that you're in a big hurry, or you must arrive exactly on time, or you're a heavy cigarette smoker, or you're addicted to Facebook and Twitter. 
5. If your HT also works as a broadcast receiver, it may work better than you think, maybe because the rail cars are so tall, you're usually on the second story, and we all know that higher is better for hams. And last, I had pretty decent coverage with a small 3G hotspot for cellular data along the way, but I still brought my repeater director and talked to hams in five states and had a great time on the rail. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP in sunny Phoenix, Arizona, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Colonel Jerry Wellman, W7SAR, former ARRL Utah Section Emergency Coordinator, was recently named the National Volunteer Emergency Manager of the Year, the highest honor given to a volunteer emergency manager by the International Association of Emergency Managers. Wellman served as the Utah Wing Civil Air Patrol Commander from September 2009 to May 2013. He served as the Emergency Services Training Officer for the Salt Lake Senior Squadron and currently serves as the Phoenix Cadet Squadron's Assistant Officer for Communication and for Education and Training. At the awards ceremony on November 14, 2022, Wellman was cited for being active in enhancing his own emergency management professional development while relentlessly contributing to his community. He taught emergency management communications classes in Arizona, Utah, and Colorado, and chaired the Kearns Utah Metro Township Emergency Planning Commission. He also served on the Utah State Emergency Response Team and volunteered in the State Emergency Operations Center, contributing more than 150 days during the COVID-19 response and during floods, fires, and winter storms. He also served as an Air Operations Coordinator on three search and rescue missions. Wellman was licensed in 1972 and holds an amateur extra class license. He is an ARRL life member and a life member of REACT International. Essays were received from young amateurs from all over the world and gave interesting perspectives on how to reach out and connect with the youth of today. The announcement of the winners was made recently by the group's president, Paul Ewing, N6PSE, of the Intrepid DX Group's Dream Rig Essay Contest. The competition draws entries from hams age 19 and younger in the U.S. and Canada. First place went to Maria Polyanska, VE3OMV, who received an ICOM IC7300 transceiver. Second place went to Ryan Kokoret, N7RSK, who received a Yesu FT65R VHF UHF handheld. Third place went to Toby Latino, AG5ZM, who received a Yesu FT65R. Intrepid DX Group President Paul S. Ewing, N6PSE, added, Having read your many essays this week, we can tell you that our youth are full of great ideas, and they are brimming with enthusiasm to keep our hobby alive and well into the future. Ewing also thanked Robert Chortek, AA6VB, for providing the funds for this year's prizes. Radio responders and residents in one part of British Columbia, Canada, can look forward to more streamlined emergency operations under a merger announced recently by officials. Two town councils in the Capital Regional District of the province have approved the merger of emergency radio teams in View Royal and nearby Colwood. View Royal Mayor Sid Tobias said the result would be greater efficiency in communications. The View Royal Fire Rescue Chief, Paul Hurst, said the teams in both municipalities will now report to a single leader, and the amount of equipment available and the number of volunteers will be doubled. Amateur radio operators are part of the municipality's response and make use of their own communication systems if the locality's cell towers are disabled in a disaster. The fire chief said that in those instances, the hams become a lifeline. Their teams staff radio rooms in the fire departments in both View Royal and Colwood, enabling them to communicate with other hams. They are also able to stay in touch with various government responders throughout the province. The fire chief called it a win-win for both municipalities. As a quick reminder, the 24th Annual Ham Radio University is set as an online conference and registration for the event is now open. With some COVID-19 restrictions still in place, 
Ham Radio University will again be an online conference on January 7th from 1300 to 2000 UTC. This is also the online convention of the New York City and Long Island section of the AWRL and will be held as a go-to webinar. The day's program will be offering 17 informational presentations ranging from the Parks on the Air experience to the basics of HF operating. Presentations will also be made by experts on contesting and DXing, as well as software-defined radios. Advanced registration is required for each presentation you plan to attend. The conference is free, but there is a suggested donation of $5. This well-attended event has been organized again this year in memory of its founder, Phil Lewis, N2MUN, who became a silent key in March of 2020. For further details and to register, visit Ham Radio University, that's all one word, hamradiouniversity.org slash forums. And wrapping up our Christmas newscast this year, NASA has a long history of hiding secret messages in spacecraft, and that tradition continued with the launch of the Orion crew capsule in November on top of the Artemis 1 rocket. Five hidden messages were placed in the Orion capsule, ranging from Morse code to musical notes. On the right side of the capsule, below a window and next to the pilot seat, were the letters C, B, A, G, and F, five musical notes for the first words in Frank Sinatra's song, Fly Me to the Moon. In the middle of the capsule, above the cockpit control console, was a Morris code message that spelled out the name Charlie in remembrance of former Orion Deputy Program Manager Charlie Lundquist, who died in 2020. Other messages included a picture of an image of a cardinal to the right of the pilot's seat as a tribute to former Orion Program Manager, Johnson Space Center Director, and St. Louis Cardinals fan Mark Geyer, who passed away in 2021. The other two messages were on top of the pilot seat, including binary code representing 18. This is in honor of NASA's history of travel to the moon with the Apollo program and to celebrate a spacecraft's return to the moon after Apollo 17 for the Artemis generation. The final message was in the front of the pilot seat. The country codes of each country within the European Space Agency that participated in developing and building the spacecraft's European service module. This week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry This Week in Amateur Radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. 
That address once again is W2XBS77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2, 